everybody. I'm Paul Turner, uh, organized in the Midwest, um, in Des Moines, Iowa. So why don't we start off with uh, Father Lucian from the Midwest area. Father Tim Lucian, I'm pastor of St. Charles Borromeo Catholic Church in Oklahoma City and a member of VOICE. And I'm representing the Midwest region, which is six organizations from the states of Nebraska, Iowa, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, and Michigan. California. Ellen McBride with St. Vincent Ferrer Parish in Vallejo, California and Common Ground. I'm representing the state of California where we have eight IAF organizations and emerging organizing efforts across the state. From Southern California to the Central Coast, to the Central Valley, the San Francisco Bay Area and North near the Oregon border. Last week, we held a statewide action with over a thousand leaders represented and we have over 50 IAF leaders and organizers present today. Let's see, let's go with uh, Texas and then the Intermountain area. And I'm Father Mike Walsh from Holy Trinity Church in Dallas. Uh, I'm speaking uh, for a member, a leader in Dallas area interface, and I'm speaking for the 10 organizations of IAF in Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, Central Texas, West Texas, El Paso, and the Rio Grande Valley. And most recently, the Texas IAF organizations have uh, organized for more than $80 million in rental assistance funds in our area. I'm Marilyn Winokur. I'm with B'nai Habara, Denver Jewish Reconstructionist Congregation, and a leader in Coloradans for the Common Good. And I'm representing the Inner Mountain area, which includes the four states of Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico and Nevada, and these four states comprise eight different IAF projects. How about the Northwest? Uh, my name is Kathy Linnell, located in South King County um, in the Seattle area, affiliated with Sound Alliance from the IAF Northwest with eight organizations in our region. Thank you. And then let's go with the Southeast region of Louisiana and Mississippi. Hi, I'm Siobhan Chapman. <laughs> I am uh, organizing in Jackson, Mississippi with Working Together Jackson, representing eight broad-based organizations in the Mississippi and Louisiana region. Glad to be here. All right. Well, so uh, without any further ado, let me introduce our guest. Um, Luke Brotherton uh, is a friend of the network and someone who's uh, been we've we've met with before and, and has written a lot about uh, our work and, and other important theological issues he's a professor of theological ethics and a senior fellow of the keenan institute for ethics at duke university and author of uh, christ and the common life so it's a huge delight and honor to to speak to you uh, from i'm speaking from north carolina i should also say i'm a member of durham can which is an IAF affiliate here in, in North Carolina. And before that, I was involved for many years um, in London Citizens, which is obviously in the UK and is, a, again, a, a, what well, was at that time an affiliate of, of the IAF. So I come to you with just over shy of 15 years or so of involvement in community organizing and particularly um, uh, service in, in, in the IAF. So um, kind of speak to you both out of my academic experience and out of that experience as well. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to kind of take some of the themes and uh, issues I talked about in the book and try and put them into a more contemporary setting, and, and hopefully that has set up a, a framework for thinking about um, some of what I talk about in the book in the contemporary moment. And through this pandemic, I've been trying to listen to those who what I think already exist in the future that's coming. This is folk who've been involved in recovering from disasters or who deal with precarious living situations every day. And such folk, I think, are time travelers. And I'm sure many of you are already familiar with this future that's coming in, into being. And one such story I've listened to is that of Christine Nieves, who helped found the Provecto Apoyo Mutuo Mariana in uh, Puerto Rico. And it was a community kitchen and mutual aid group that emerged in response to Hurricane Maria in 2017. And she relates how it was born out of the realization that FEMA was not coming, but people needed help. 
So they began with something really primal and basic, which was the need for cooked food. But this turned into feeding the sense that they were not alone and that they had a common life together. And through it, they could find solutions to the problems they faced. And in the process, Christine tells a story of how they discovered their own agency, dignity, and leadership. And it's a story that I think anyone involved in community, community organizing will be familiar with. In what Christine Nieves says of Apoyo Mutuo, and I think what many of us have experienced through community organizing, we see a movement from what the ancient Greeks called Zoe, it's bare life sustained by the basic needs for food, shelter, and warmth, to bios, or a shared moral and political life through which a sense of meaning and purpose is cultivated and sustained. This is a journey from merely surviving to thriving. And building on this insight, the great uh, Athenian uh, or, um, philosopher Aristotle saw politics as a vital means through which humans made this journey from surviving to thriving. Politics was how humans cultivated and sustained a common life through which a life of meaning and purpose was possible. We see a parallel, I think, in Genesis. Adam shares animate life with other creatures, but it's only in and through a common life with, a, with another human that Adam discovers what it means to be fully human. Here at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. In scripture, communion with God takes concrete form uh, uh, through a common life with and for neighbors. And this common life is how we discover who we are and fulfill what it means to flourish as creatures. The cultivation of this common life both blesses us and is a blessing to those around us. Now, the implication of this is that to become human is to be embedded in relations of care, even when these cause toil, grief, and pain. As in the story of Cain and Abel, to deny how we come to be through mutually responsible, cooperative fellowship with others is to deny our humanity and turn away from God. Conversely, to turn towards it is to embrace the God-given order for human flourishing. Now, this, of course, is the story of Exodus, which is not simply a story of liberation from oppression. It's perhaps more fundamentally a story of a movement from merely surviving to becoming a people whose common life was characterized by justice and righteousness. This just and righteous common life of interdependent care and mutual blessing is a picture of true human flourishing or shalom and was to be a sign to all nations of what human flourishing looked like. To turn back to Egypt where you had enough to eat but had no uh, dignity where, uh, where you survived but you did not thrive was to turn one's back on the God-given order for the meaning and purpose of human life. Now, I think at an evolutionary level, uh, it is the specific ways humans depend on and care for and cooperate with each other that accounts for what differences there are between humans, for example, and our primate cousins. Echoing what Christine Nieves discovered in Puerto Rico, the first of these practices is that humans cook and need to cook their food and animals do not. Literally, our jaws wouldn't, uh, would have to be much, much bigger and our brains wouldn't have developed into the size they have if we hadn't actually started cooking our food. And as we all know, cooking is not just about getting the right nutrients uh, so our brain and bodies can function. Cooking creates a common life. It generates intimacy, joy, festivity, Cooking is a basis of culture and a shared meaning and purpose. In cooking, we survive and thrive both at the same time. We bless and we ourselves are blessed. Community organizing is like cooking. It enables both surviving and thriving. But instead of eating together, echoing Aristotle, it's doing politics together that enables us to survive, thrive and bless each other. In enabling us to come together to meet basic needs, we discover a greater sense of meaning and purpose as well as our dignity and leadership. 
And this was a central insight of Saul Alinsky back in the 1930s in Chicago during the previous Great Depression when fighting the meatpacking industry, something I know Omaha together uh, one community is doing today. It was an insight that led him to found the IAF in 1940. Now I've done a great deal of research and writing on Alinsky, it's somewhere I find very compelling. And he was equally critical of state welfare programs, non-governmental charity and big corporations. He saw all of them as failing to address the real needs and undermining people's dignity. His approach to addressing social and economic needs was to enable people to take responsibility and act for themselves and thereby forge a common life with and for each other that they had some control over. This, of course, is summarized in the great maxim of community organizing, never do for others what they can do for themselves. As Alinsky put it in his first book, Reveille for Radicals, this then is our real job. It is the breaking down of the feeling on the part of our people that they are socially isolated with no stake in the future, rather than human beings in possession of all the responsibility, strength and human dignity, which constitutes the heritage of free citizens of a democracy. As in Exodus, so in organizing, it's the formation of a people whose common life is characterized by justice, generosity, and mutual care that is the form and measure of human flourishing. The issues, decent housing, living wages, health and safety measures, are the beginning point, but they're not the main point. The main point of organizing is the quality and character of relations between people strengthening local institutions which people have created for themselves to meet their needs, congregations, burial societies, credit unions and the like, and linking and strengthening relations between these institutions. A thriving neighborhood or city or state is dependent on an ecology of trust and mutual aid, as well as strong institutions serving the interests of their members to sustain this trust and mutual care over time. None of this happens spontaneously, it needs organizing. Now, through organizing, people develop the agency to have some say over the conditions and character of their common life on which everyone depends to survive and thrive. And through organizing, we can act, not simply be acted upon by state and market mechanisms. As Alinsky saw it, de democratic politics is another name for this kind of work. Democracy at heart is about forming a common life through ensuring the political and economic agency, i.e. the agency to forge and sustain a common life, is distributed as widely as possible. Democratic politics think, can be distinguished from democracy as a mode of statecraft, i.e. democracy reduced to voting systems, separation of powers, laws, bureaucracy, etc. Democratic politics names a set of practices for generating non-violent forms of relational power and cooperation through various kinds of shared speech and action. Community organizing is one, trade unions another, cooperatives as a further example. Democratic politics in this sense means not just participation in decision making, but also the capacity of ordinary people to act collectively to reconstitute their common life through shared speech and action. But at the heart of dem democratic politics is a paradox. Democracy presumes the existence of and depends on people and institutions committed to respecting the dignity of each individual, dialogue and suasion as against killing and coercion as means of resolving conflicts, and that people should have a say in the decisions that affect them. Yet democracy is forged out of immoral people hierarchical and often authoritarian institutions, and is plagued by the despotism of either the one, the few, or the many. Neither the state, the market, a radical ideology, or a technocratic elite can generate the personal dispositions needed for a freer, more egalitarian, just, and democratic society to emerge. Merely changing the imminent structures and systems of power is never enough. Egypt abolished, is not Israel empowered. Alongside legal and institutional changes, new ways of acting, ways not determined by the structures and habits of Egypt. And this takes changed hearts and minds. 
As Alinsky realized, people who are atomized and alienated need reforming, reforming into a people through changes in the quality and character of the relationships between them so that they may be capable of acting together in pursuit of life-giving goods in common through democratic means. This is the story of Exodus, and Zelensky realized this is the work of organizing. So part of the work of organizing through which we survive and thrive is this work of forming a people with the quality and character of relations needed to undertake that work democratically. Through organizing together, we not only discover our shared agency and leadership, we also cultivate virtues of patience, courage, hope and the like, which enable us to address the inevitable conflicts that arise between us without killing each other, as Cain did to Abel, or coercing each other, as the Egyptians did to Israel. Virtues like patience, courage, hope and love are necessary if our common life is to be just and generous. They enact what the Hebrew scriptures call tezakah u mishpat, or justice and righteousness, which was the God-given basis for coven the covenantal life of the people of God. As I noted in relation to Exodus, in scripture, true flourishing is built on a just and generous common life, a measure of which is active concern for the marginal and vulnerable. The movement from surviving to thriving is this movement of forming a people. The work of cultivating a people is never done, but it is nevertheless a work of true beauty. It does not display those characteristics we tend to associate with beauty. It's not harmonious, it's often far from being charming or graceful. It's politics, so it's messy, it's complicated, it's full of tension and agitation and brash noise. But theologically understood, it's truly beautiful because the great second century theologian Irenaeus of Lyon said, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. And for a human being to be fully alive, requires a person to move beyond mere survival to participation in a people who are cultivating a just and generous common life over time through politics. This is the work of organizing. And because its fruit is human beings fully alive, that is human beings realizing their dignity through fellowship and mutual blessing as part of a people, such a work truly glorifies God. And what glorifies God, as theologians from Aquinas to Balthazar has taught us, is what true beauty consists of. It's beatific beauty. Now, I want now to contrast and draw this to a close, but contrast this vision of democratic politics as the cultivation of a just and generous common life I've just outlined with how most politicians, journalists and academics view politics. And for this, I turn to the 17th century English thinker, Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes gave an early and now classic account of modern politics as about statecraft. Statecraft is what most people think of when we use the word politics. It signifies bureaucracies, elections, parties, laws, and the like, all of which constitute the sovereign state. For Hobbes, the sovereign state, or what he called Leviathan, after the biblical sea monster, was there to protect and sustain life. Outside of its protection and provision, Life was, as Hobbes said, was nasty, brutish, and short. Without the sovereign state, we could not serve, let alone thrive. Now, the price of its protection and provision was we give up a measure of our freedom. The state gets to tell us what to do and how to do it, having ultimate authority over our lives. And in return, we can turn to the state to defend us, organize us, and provide what we need at a point of crisis. Now, this is played out in the pandemic where we are literally confined, or many are confined to their homes, and we've given up our freedom, while we look to the state to protect us from what will kill us and act to save us economically. Now, how well it does this is another matter. But contrary to what Hobbes argued, politics is not just statecraft. As I've set out here, politics is also a way of sustaining a common life in the ecologies of trust and mutual aid this is based on. Again, coping with disasters, whether pandemics or hurricanes, bring this, this home with stark clarity. The state can be a crucial means of providing the basic conditions of life in the form of FEMA. 
So, but so is this social infrastructure of mutual aid between neighbors and families and self-organized institutions like congregations. This often invisible social infrastructure can make the difference between life and death. As the story of uh, Christine Yebes makes clear, this social infrastructure is vital for providing food and physical support long before state services arrive or become operational. This meshwork of self-organized relationships, social practices and institutions and the ecology of trust they foster enables us to respond to shocks and disasters, whether they're economic as in the Great Recession, natural as in Hurricane Katrina or biological as in this pandemic. Where it's absent, we either die or we become entirely dependent on the state. Now, Democrat, Democrats and Republicans focus on state and market-centric solutions to shared problems or disasters. None really attends to the need to strengthen this social infrastructure. They're not interested in developing policies and practices that distribute power so that more and more people have the agency by which to craft a thriving common life. For decades, Republicans have been obsessed with how the market is the basis of our common life, while Democrats of all stripes focus on the state. Both concentrate power, one in the hands of technocrats offering top-down state-centric solutions to shared problems, the other in the hands of plutocrats by offering market-centric solutions. And both use statecraft to achieve these ends. And for both parties, statecraft is the only legitimate form of politics. Anything that's not statecraft is labeled as volunteering or, or seen as unpolitical. And both operate with ideologies that subordinate the state and market, uh, subordinate to the state and market, the ecology of trust, relational practices and mutual aid on which we all depend, depend to survive, let alone thrive. In doing so, Democrats and Republicans perpetuate the myth that the real conflict is between market and state. But this is a false story, albeit one that serves their self-interest. No, the real conflict is between the market state on one side and society on the other. Community organizing sits at the cusp between the market state on one side and the social infrastructure of trust, self-organized institutions and relational practices on the other. It reweaves and strengthens society through holding the state and market more accountable. Now, there's always a need to tend and defend our shared social life against being entirely subordinated to and frankly often desecrated by the market state. The fight is to stop our common life serving state and market and ensure state and market mechanisms serve and uphold the flourishing of society. It's exactly this struggle that lies before us in recovering from this pandemic. The irony is that neither the market nor the state can function well unless embedded in a rich ecology of social trust. If the banks lose trust, then we have a run on the banks and the financial system collapses. If we don't trust the opposition when we lose an election, then we take to the hills with the AR-15s or AK-47s and the government collapses into civil war. If we're going to have a just transition to recovery and the formation of a new normal, we need a dance between statecraft that protects and provides and a democratic politics of a common life. Building up the common life of trust and mutual care and strengthening local institutions is key to developing a just and resilient recovery. The state and market have a place, but they must know their place. State policies and economic provision are vital. Mutual aid is not an alternative to state provision, but sits alongside it. We're not anarchists after all. The state has a role, as per Hobbes. We need public authorities to coordinate and provide. For example, producing a vaccine will need state investment and coordination of research and delivery. Neither are we libertarians. Not everything can be left up to the market. Indeed, the market often fails to provide, especially for the most vulnerable, who depend on a combination of macro-scale state provision and micro-scale mutual aid. And economic policies and practices cannot be allowed to undermine a just recovery by concentrating power and money in the hands of large corporations, as happened in the wake of the Great Recession, 
where we saw the banks bailed out, but not the homeowners. So a democratic common life politics is vital for ensuring state and market do not take the opportunity of this emergency to exponentially increase their power. That will take organizing. But in that work of organizing, amidst its inevitable struggles and frustrations, we can take heart that such work is a thing of true beauty. It's the meat and drink of human flourishing. And from Genesis to Revelation, scripture tells us that this is the work that God blesses. So that's my, I don't know if I've reached my 20 minutes, but that's my kind of preface remarks. Ernesto Cortez is the co-director of the Industrial Areas Foundation and director of the regional West Southwest IAF. And he's uh, hosting this seminar, this series of seminars. Uh, so to, to respond and to organize our responders as well, Mr. Uh, Cortez. Thank you very, very much. And Luke, thank you for that presentation. Uh, I heard almost all of it. Uh, and it sounded very cogent and interesting. Um, I think I, we, we talked a little bit beforehand, and I want Rabbi Leiter to tell us, uh, in reaction to you, why the promised land is for grown-ups. Thank you. Thank you, Ernie. It's good to be here today. And uh, thank you, Dr. Bretherton, for inspiring us and teaching us. And uh, so the promised land, yeah, the promised land is for, is for grown-ups. You're right, Ernie. And um, you know, there's a reason why we had those 40 years coming um, as the people out of slavery uh, into freedom, but not yet a people, not yet a people. Um, and in fact, I want to again thank Dr. Brotherton because the Hebrew that he wove into his remarks today, near and dear to my heart. Um, and as we delve into those words, we find sustenance, sustenance in those words. So we, we know, of course, um, from his remarks that Adam, Adam, the first human being, is related to the soil, to the earth, emerging from the earth, and this beautiful teaching that it's through the sharing of common life with Eve that he comes into his whole um, being as a human being. But one of the beautiful things about Eve's name in Hebrew, Kava, is that it comes from the word for life. It's related to breath. It's related to what it means for us to inhabit these bodies, to be filled with neshama, to be filled with soul and breath. Um, that is her role. That is what she gives to the world. And when I think about us now in our role as organizers in this time and how hard we have been working, um, one of the organizers on the call said, We've crammed into the last two months what would have taken us a year to do. But these times have uh, called us forward in faith and in strength, but it requires breath. And I think one of the beautiful things that Chava, that Eve can teach us through this image in the book of Genesis is that we need to breathe, we need to take care of ourselves. We need to have a Sabbath. We need to stop. The Hebrew word Sabbath, Shabbat, means to stop. Um, and to feed our own souls so that we can keep going in this work. As Ernie said, you know, promised land is for grown-ups and uh, the Midbar, the wilderness or the desert that we wandered in was the first destination out of coming out of Egypt. And Egypt is an amazing, amazing word in Hebrew. The word is Mitzrayim and it literally means from the narrows. From the narrow place, we came out into freedom. And it's such a beautiful image that in a sense, as painful as Egypt was for us, it was our birthplace, right? That we came out through this narrow place into this broad, expansive area where we felt completely nonplussed, completely not knowing what we're doing, wandering around, Perhaps this is an image that we can relate to now in these days of pandemic, but headed towards the promised land where freedom is not freedom for the sake of freedom. Freedom is for the sake of responsibility, of entering into this covenantal relationship that Dr. Bretherton talked about today, 
we're coming out of the narrows into expansiveness and in a sense into another place of constraint which is responsibility but it's a responsibility it's a place of constraint that has freedom in it because it leads to that thriving that we learned about not just surviving but thriving and lastly i just want to point out how wonderful it was to hear Dr. Bretherton mentioned shalom and to leave this word untranslated in his remarks today. Shalom, many of us know as peace, but it's also a beautiful verb in Hebrew that means wholeness. It means to, to create something that isn't whole and to make it whole, which is peace also, but it has a slightly different nuance in different places in our tradition. And so, this is my wish and my blessing for all of us as organizers is that we feel we move towards that sense of wholeness through the breath of Chava, through the breath of our biblical mother Eve. And we give ourselves that uh, Sabbath that we need to reflect, to rejoice in our achievements and to refuel ourselves once again for this commitment of thriving in the world. Thank you. Our next responder is Pastor Theron Jackson, uh, the pastor of Morningside Baptist Church in Shreveport, Louisiana, and a leader with Together Louisiana. So, Pastor Jackson. Uh, I want to say thank you to um, Brother Bretherton for um, that presentation. I try to contextualize that by looking through the lenses of those of us who are here in Louisiana as we're seeking to reimagine our state um, with this notion of a new normal. Um, that there are a lot of reasons why we have to persist toward organizing because the needs of the poor and more urban communities still cry for that need. Uh, historically, there have been institutions, and I, as I listen, to the comments that been, I recognize that there have been institutions that have evolved uh, and emerged to create a necessary sense of agency, dignity, and leadership when there was no other um, kind, uh, particularly churches and mutual aid societies or institutions that have created the, that invisible social infrastructure from whether it be benevolent funds, um, putting uh, money together to send children to college, uh, eating from house to house. Um, that was always that that infrastructure that was um, that was a kind of invisible infrastructure. To, uh, Pre Professor Bretherton spoke of this notion of the necessity of an ecology of trust, but I had to look through the real lens of the fact that we have uh, lived for a long time in my community to, uh, in an ecology of suspicion, where uh, in a, a historically uh, justifiable distrust exists of both state and market uh, that create a juxtaposition between uh, the need to be independent, to survive, and the need to organize in order to thrive. Uh, we have we face disasters, whether they be natural, economic, or biological. And we know that disasters, whether they are natural, economic, or biological, are not inherently discriminatory or biased. But when combined with uh, the presence of human evil in the form of dehumanization, discrimination, and racism, they create pre-existing conditions that exacerbate the impact of each of these inevitable disasters for people who are marginalized and who lack the agency to deal with these evil pre-existing conditions. As I reflect on the Exodus theme that the professor um, lifted, we also uh, have to remember as the Hebrew people began their Exodus, they do so after four centuries of a pre-existing condition. Their Egyptian condition was not their starting point. There was a pre-existing condition. If you remember, they go in a family, they come out what appears to be a nation, but you remember their native land, they, they were the victims of a natural disaster that we call famine. Um, their natural, this natural disaster, which forces them to move to a place that appears to be a blessing for a moment until there was a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph or the beginning, if you will, of that intervention of human evil. They now face the, the vulnerability of immigration, the status of being alien that make them the flavor of the month, uh, as long as their servitude is useful and as long as, uh, you know, even like in our day, as long as we like their restaurants and um, they can cook, they become problematic, however, when their demographic data grew too, grew too large and their use of the healthcare system became unacceptable. Uh, I think we look at scripture, Exodus turns from individual deliverance to collective deliverance. And it is uh, this sense in this sense that the Exodus event is a political event. Uh, it is about the collective deliverance of a subjugated class of people from political oppression and economic exploitation. This political nature of Exodus is epitomized in Exodus chapter three, verses seven and eight, 
which narrates God's liberating response to the cries of the oppressed. I hear God saying, I have, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings and I've come down to deliver them. What we are told here is that there, this is, excuse me, that, that it was not the Hebrews' religious sensibilities, nor was it their worship pieties that accounted for God's intervention in their desperate predicament. Rather, according to God's own testimony in this scripture, it was their political plight. In fact, the book of Exodus tells us that when it came to worshiping God, the Hebrews were not particularly commendable in the sense that as a group, they might have, may not have even been um, monotheistic, uh, maybe even uh, henotheistic, which means even though they believe in one God, they also acknowledge the existence of other deities. Um, this is reflected, I believe, in the first commandment in which the Hebrews are specifically commanded to worship no other gods. Um, so thus, the liberating action of God in the Exodus was not in response to worship pieties, but it was to in response to their political plight. I think the term Hebrews itself confirms that it, it is primarily a social political identity, specifically a class identity, rather than just a religious identity. Um, in effect, the testimony of God, the testimony, excuse me, of the Exodus is that defi the defining root event from which Israel sprang was God's act of taking the side of the oppressed. In the final analysis, the seminal importance of the Exodus event, in my opinion, is that in God's response to class oppression of the Hebrews, God firmly posited justice and liberation as the very foundation of biblical faith. So, uh, liberation, in my opinion, from pre-existing conditions for people who were subjected to generations of oppression and who were vulnerable as a class of immigrants is a prerequisite to pursuing any kind of life or any notion of a new normal. Self-identity and self-determination become the prescriptions to treat the pre-existing conditions. If not, we have the rough reality that the pre-existing conditions may seem uh, normal. And it is then that it is not in one's best interest to return to normal, rather to continue to strive to create that beautiful, that beatifically beautiful and just common life that the professor speaks of that might be, I mean, excuse me, that might describe what we hope will be a new normal. Thank you. Um, I want to turn it over to, to uh, Professor Brotherton again to respond. But before we do that, I'd like to ask Jorge to tell a little story out of the Denver experience, which refers back to, we started off organizing and meatpacking, and we're, we're still in meatpacking. But before I say, before Jorge comes on, I want to say, uh, what I'd like to sum up what we've heard is, Michael Walzer has a phrase in his book, Exodus and Revolution, that it took God one day to take the Hebrews out of Egypt, but 40 years to take Egypt out of the Hebrews, okay? And so part of what we're doing, trying to do is to take each of that dark, narrow, uh, well, not dark, but narrow place. We're trying to get out of that narrow place. And that, that takes a lot of patient and a lot of relational work. Jorge? The only point you made, uh, as uh, Ernie pointed out and Dr. Brotherton mentioned, uh, 80 years ago, we started, uh, I have started organizing meatpacking workers. And in Colorado, uh, meatpackers in Greeley, northern, northern Colorado, um, have been at the center of this uh, virus uh, outbreak. And they were ignored, uh, largely ignored. They were ignored even when their union cried out for help for the governor. And it was not until Coloradans for the common good leaders acted uh, that they were able to get the attention of the state and gained additional protections for them, including emergency health leave with pay and uh, free childcare for the duration of this of this crisis. Uh, and uh, yesterday we had a gathering of uh, 15 clergy in the Greeley area who are coming together to figure out what they can do uh, with and for their neighbors uh, in the meatpacking plant. Thank you, wonderful, uh, wonderful set of responses. Um, I kind of want to link Pastor uh, Jackson's um, and, and uh, Rabbi's comments really. I think that that is the the i think i love the way you framed it as pre-existing conditions that's exactly right um and how we that that always needs to be um wrestled with and, and identified and named um and that the the refusal to accept what counts as normal as normal and and i think just to locate that in the moment i think we do have a moment 
because there's a kind of an opening up of really fundamental questions um, about how we're going to do life together, that there is a chance to challenge these things. Now, I that that uh, that that need to challenge has always been overly burdened, particularly I think on Af African American communities and, and Latino communities and, and Native communities. Um, that I guess is there now an opportunity? I guess it's a question: Is there now opportunity? For others to join in that struggle and not accept the the current normal as an existing normal, and the ways in which um, the state and market processes together just kind of, you know, literally dehumanise us um, in so many different ways, and, and how that falls very heavily on certain populations. Then the question comes: Is well, we can we can posit liberation? and the need for that and identify and name the sources of grievous harm, where do we get the energy to move beyond it? And, and I think that's where James Cone in his wonderful book on the spirituals and the blues reflects on the spirituals as both lament and praise. And I think that's, it, it, for me, there's something there about uh, what, the, what Rabbi was getting to in, it's, it's when we come together with others and discover that song that is both lament and praise, that, uh, that that is that moment when we discover an Eve, that breath of life that gives us an energy to go on. And so this, I don't know, I'm sure many of us have experienced it if we've both been involved in organizing, that, that kind of bizarre way in which in the struggle for justice, one finds an energy one finds a new hope um, and that these two things in a sense come together it is both it is in the struggle to move beyond surviving that we discover paradoxically a kind of thriving a kind of uh, a, a certain kind of a joy and a, and a delight in each other through that mutual care and shared shared work and i think that gives us an energy to to kind of make this movement um, and I think that's what I wanted to kind of name, and I think it was beautifully put there um, in, in that picture of Eve, and and how that kind of that movement out of a narrow place, in a sense, we we, we can't just think of that term in terms of um, kind of pure labour uh, of of struggle, but but in that place, how do we encourage each other and discover a certain joy to have that energy to go on? And I think that's. It's, it, there's going to be huge demands um, coming into this moment. Um, and, and again, they will be unfairly distributed across the population. Um, but that question is, where does the energy come from for that work? And, and how in the work do the means uh, kind of prefigure the end? How, does, how, do we, how do we cultivate those virtues of patience, hope through the work that ensures what we're moving towards is a more patient, hopeful, loving vision of human life together. So I'll just, I'll leave it there and, and I'm sure others have questions. Yeah, and I would like to get Josephine to react a bit by telling the story of DAI dealing with the, 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 the Paris ID uh, card. My name is Josephine lopez Paul. I'm the lead organizer with Dallas Area Interfaith. And it was the slow patient work that we've been doing over the last three years that really is now saving people's lives, and I'm gonna to get to that in a second. I just, in 2017, Texas passed Senate Bill 4, which was the harshest anti-immigrant bill we've seen in our country. And this allowed uh, police officials to ask a person's uh, document status when, if they uh, were collaborating with police. So immediately we saw pervasive fear throughout our city and a decline in reporting to the police departments. Uh, in 2018, uh, DAI met with three police departments and we got the commitments from them to accept a parish ID so that immigrants could feel comfortable collaborating with police departments. Over the last couple years, we have been doing the deep institutional work, working with the Catholic Diocese of Dallas and have issued now more than 12,000 IDs. The, the IDs have given immigrants a peace of mind to live and to flourish in our city. And it's developed leaders and teams in our parishes. What we learned uh, by doing this was initially we went to the city and we asked the city of Dallas to propose a municipal ID and they wouldn't do it because in New York, the federal government had sequestered the records. 
um, and had gone after folks who were undocumented. Our parish ID is more secure than any municipal ID because the federal government can't sequester the records of a church. Um, all of this has been great and has been important, but we didn't know then what an important tool it would be when the pandemic hit. In the first two weeks, our leaders reached out to many of these folks registered for a parish ID, more than 3,000 families, and we asked four questions. How are you? Is anyone sick in your family? What is the most pressing need in your family? And would you be willing to gather others on a Zoom meeting? Our efforts have resulted in DAI redirecting the food banks to nine parishes serving 18,000 families, reorganizing the rental assistance program of $26 million so that it reaches the most vulnerable in our city. And now it's literally saving lives. Our leaders learned that to get COVID testing 19 in Dallas, he was required a government issued ID. We were able to negotiate with the Dallas County Medical uh, Department to accept the, the parish ID for COVID testing. So all of this was built from the slow patient work of developing leaders, getting people in conversations and the institution standing with families. And we were able to act on that. Maggie Conroe, um, you know, I mean, a part of what, why you unmute yourself? What I think Exodus sounds like it was about was, was evidence. I mean, you have to have some demonstrated sense that liberation is possible. So we wanted Maggie to share a little bit about uh, the last couple of years, the organizing in Louisiana and one fight in particular. Maggie. So my name is Maggie Conroe, and I'm gonna tell you an organizing story from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And to keep with the biblical theme, we'll call it a David and Goliath story, okay? So my mom has taught in public schools for more than 25 years. And um, and in 2018, she took home a smaller paycheck than she did a decade earlier in 2008. Citing budget constraints and shortfalls, our state failed to give teachers a raise or even adjust for inflation for over a decade. And yet Louisiana, home to some of the largest industries, Shell, Exxon, Dow, et cetera, continued to award gratuitous tax exemptions as part of an 80 year old program known as the Industrial Tax Exemption Program or ITEP. So a few years ago, Together Baton Rouge took on reforming this archaic tax program as one of our issues that we worked on. And especially considering these international giants that we're up against, we have had some really big wins. Sorry, I'm holding my kitten. I don't know if that's picking up on the mic. Um, so because of our organizing, local entities like school boards and city councils have the final say on whether we give away money before it was determined by an appointed state board exclusively. And because of our organizing, industries don't get to have 100% of its property tax exempt as it could have been before. And in 2019, as a direct result of our organizing around this issue and reforming this flawed program, our state saw $116 million of net new income just in 2019. So last year, and I remember the date because it was the eve of my mom's 60th birthday, it was January 18th, I, along with 100 other members of Together Baton Rouge and our member institutions, turned out for a school board meeting. In that meeting, we successfully defeated an exemption application for ExxonMobil. And that was the first time in Louisiana history that that had ever happened with that company. Had that ITEP passed, our school system would have seen educator layoffs this past year. Had it passed, it would have been the 120th approved application for ExxonMobil. It would have been another $8 million awarded to industry, adding to the already absurd amount of over $700 million that had been taken away from just Baton Rouge schools since 2000. So I love the note that Luke finished on, organizing is a thing of true beauty. Um, it was an incredibly powerful experience to fight in, more importantly, to win alongside my neighbors and community members on behalf of my mom and her colleagues and students and for our community. So organizing can be small things, but it can also yield results for these big, you know, incredibly large, unimaginable wins. And we're still doing that work here in Louisiana. Just a quick, quick response. I mean, I think those are, those are fantastic stories and they both are about the conditions of agency. Uh, you, you know, you, how do we act with and for each other? And often the, this, the, the kind of um, health and vibrancy of our, uh, of our social infrastructure 
is undermined. A, if there's all the money is being bled out of it, uh, and, and things like teachers aren't getting paid properly, or we literally are in terror of going out in public because we don't have ID cards uh, to enable us to kind of meet with others. And so I think in both of those stories, it, and I think a lot of work in organizing it, 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 in, 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 you know, has been focused around what are the enabling conditions of agency and, and how are those are often invisible um, uh, and are operating out of sight that are then disabling certain kinds of people from being able to act with and for each other. And I think, yeah, both of those stories are really have kind of got behind the immediate issues and, and unveiled and then addressed constructively uh, ways in which people were in being inhibited from and, and drained of the capacity to act together. Bishop Dan, go ahead. Professor, uh, you said Anglicanism prioritizes association, uh, interactive pluralism, uh, contemplative pragmatism, moral discourse, but American society's become more polarized now than it's been since the 1850s. Anti-Semitic attacks in Colorado went up 56% last year. Um, historically, recessions have exacerbated uh, political extremism. And I'm, which calls to mind Coleridge opposing uh, the Jacobins and the anti-Jacobins alike, but opposing extremism doesn't make it go away because it doesn't in, engage its causes. So my question is, does uh, Anglican public theology, as you've written about it, offer us any guidance as to how and why uh, to reconcile all people to each other or perhaps less uh, ambitiously to achieve a limited peace? Yeah, no, I think that's a, it's a great question. I, I, should, I should make a distinction between the kind of practice of most Anglicans, uh, who, as I, I will speak to my own soul, uh, who are kind of wishy-washy, fence-sitting, um, you know, we, 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 we kind of re reach for uh, notions like tolerance and being nice uh, as the answer to everything. So that, that I want to kind of make a distinction between the lived practice of most of us uh, and what resources Anglicans down the ages might have for this moment. Um, in terms of um, thinking about the moment, I think this question of, um, uh, you know, you don't have to tolerate the intolerable, as it were. Like, there, there are limits. Um, when people have, uh, you know, bombs and kind of violent intent, um, well, that's criminal and there's there's a role, you know, we, we need to kind of call that what it is. Um, but there's also a sense of, I think, in Anglican theology, and here I'm thinking particularly of, of the parish as a centre, uh, and it's shared with, with Catholic um, uh, theology as well, but, but in in the, in the Anglican context, the kind of role of the parish is, is, is there's been a lot of reflection on the nature of the parish and how outside of the national, the state, the party politic, can forms of parish level identity be crafted? And so uh, just to give a concrete example of that in uh, from the London context and the organizing work I was involved in there, the um, there were real divisions between uh, Muslims, uh, Jews, and Christians, and, and they were violent at times, real violent, violent conflicts. Graves were desecrated, uh, churches, mosques, synagogues attacked. You know, this was, it was very serious. When people, there was a kind of public debate around the role of citizenship that operated at a kind of national level. And most Muslims, you know, particularly in that context from Bangladesh and elsewhere, went, that's got nothing to do with us. In fact, you know, we're at war in Iraq and elsewhere. We feel victimized by this, by this state, by Britain, even, and we're, we're minoritized within it. But when we try to think about that in terms of kind of parish level identity or, or and, and the crafting of a shared civic story about what each could contribute in learning the histories of each community and then working together on shared issues, whether it's a living wage or debt issues, then actually a, a shared identity amidst actually very fraught and polarized conflict could emerge. And I think 
that place of the parish, that place of the local, as an alternative site of civic identity and citizenship. And I think it's there in the um, ID card story that we heard earlier, the sense in which uh, actually you can be a participant in the citizenship of the parish or the, or, or the city in a way in which one's fundamentally excluded from the kind of national story or, 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 uh, or minoritized and victimized in that story. And so I think there is some wisdom there about the centrality of the parish as a, as a primary site of identity and re-narrating who we are together at that level, even while it can be ve still very hostile and polarized at a national level. Okay, Ernie, I think uh, the floor is yours. Well, the only thing I want to say is I want to thank Luke and I want to thank everybody for your patience. Uh, I'd like to ask Luke to maybe say one word uh, about this whole concept that I've been kind of struggling with, this notion of two solidarities, which is in a book by Margaret, uh, Margaret where he talks about the solidarity of fate and the solidarity of destiny and that we, we can participate in the solidarity of fate, which is memory and victimhood and victimization and suffering and identifying with people suffering a ministry of presence, or we can be in a solidarity of fate and agency, making history, uh, acting on the world, uh, taking risks, making commitments, and it requires courage to move from one solidarity to the other. And I, hopefully that's what we're trying to do is to teach people through action and reflection and, and, and social, creating social knowledge and being attentive to people's situation and context. We're creating that potential solidarity and relationality of agency, okay? And so hopefully that makes sense, that's coherent. Luke, any reaction quickly? Um, in, uh, Ernie, in response to you, I think, um, I think that I, I, I'm nervous about separating those two things. I think um, I think a lot of political work takes place, if it's, if it's meaningful political work, emerges out of and takes place at the site of a wound. Um, oh, I agree. I, I'm not, I'm, I'm sorry. And I apologize if I separated them. They're, they're, they're in tandem. They go together. Go ahead. Yeah, go together. And so, and so at that site of a wound, um, there's, there's the understanding of the wound. There's abiding with the wound. Now, often what happens is, people jump to an analysis of that wound, what that wound is. Um, I don't, and, and you know, this may, might be controversial, but I think, I don't necessarily, I think in my neighbors who I live around here and Trump supporters, I can hear something of their struggles without having to buy their analysis of their, their story they tell to make sense of that wound. And it seems to me the action and reflection is how do we, and that's the kind of tradition of popular education that I, I know you only have been very influenced by, we've talked about it in the past, going all the way back to the populists of the 1870s, 1890s, of how do we, uh, how do we kind of develop a better story to make sense of that wound? One that isn't kind of closed in and defensive, but opens people out to kind of some form of building a common life with others, even those they find scandalous or threatening or radically disagree with. Um, and so I think there's that work of abiding and, 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 and identifying the wound that people feel, um, and, but, but not necessarily buying the analysis, and it, but then in the process of working to craft a different kind of analysis, actually then that's that movement to uh, the solidarity of destiny. I just want to leave with two two other kind of forms of solidarity that I think kind of help thinking about this. And, and that's, it seems to me, we're all caught between a being members of a particular community of faith, F-A-I-T-H, um, and that might be in our congregations, but it can be other kind of cultural identifiers we have, a, a sense of a shared story and commitments we have, and how that must inevitably be negotiated with a, commun a shared community of fate, an F-A-T-E. And, and when uh, that community of fate comes in, when the hurricane comes in, when the pandemic comes in, uh, when the water's cut off or the electricity's cut off, 
doesn't matter what our community of faith, we're all having to na navigate this shared community of fate. And I think part of the, the, the struggle is um, often communities of faith opposed against each other and left to their own resources. And it seems to be the work of part of the work of organizing is building links between those communities of fate, a faith, so that we can craft together a meaningful, a more meaningful shared community of fate. And rather than have that community of fate be dictated to just by kind of uh, concentrations of power in the market and the state. So I think hopefully that's a, a different kind of vision of how these solidarities can, can work together as well. But I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, I'd love to have this conversation go longer. Uh, for the book that I read years ago, which was very instrumental in my own thinking, called Jesus Before Christianity by a South African priest who talked about we have to choose whether or not we're going to be people of fate or of faith. One, the people of faith take risks, they make commitments. Uh, people of faith say, they said, I said, ah, it's God's will, whatever, providence. But we can talk more about that another time.